Hello, so today is mine and John's anniversary. Uh, we've been together 12 years today. Um, and this kind of got me thinking today about the last 12 years and about our relationship and about a lot of people who in the past said that I wouldn't be able to have relationships, that I wouldn't be able to do what normal people do. Um, and I've seen a lot on social media and a lot of things and heard a lot of um, people in like professional people like social services, social workers and stuff say that disabled people and people with learning difficulties cannot have relationships because they do not understand what a relationship is. They do not understand what love is. So they are inca incapable of it. And I just think that that is totally wrong. Um, and I am kind of living proof that the fact that that is wrong. Uh, both me and my partner are in a way, really. Uh, because I have physical disabilities. Uh, I also have mental disabilities and learning difficulties and mental health issues. Uh, I am on the autistic spectrum. Uh, my partner John, he has ADHD and possible Asperger's syndrome, which is now known as high-functioning autism. Um, he also has mental health issues. Um, and yeah, we've been together 12 years. We've been in a relationship for 12 years. So if it wasn't possible for people on the spectrum to have a relationship, then what, what do you call this? You know, um, and in my experience, Disabled people, people on the spectrum, neuro, or I'll just call them neurodiverse people. That's the term that's being thrown around nowadays for people with neurological disorders such as autism and whatnot. So neurodiverse people, in my experience, neurodiverse people understand relationships and love and emotion more than normal people. Um, you know, we may not show it in the same way, we, you know, we may not perceive it in the same way, um, but we do understand it. You know, we have a lot of empathy and that. Uh, and in my experience, we love harder. And when I say we love harder, I don't mean in a sexual way. I mean in an emotional connection way. Because um, when we make a connection with someone, that's a big thing. Um, for normal people, they don't think about that. They, they don't got to think about stuff like that. They make connections every day with people without even blinking an eye. But neurodiverse people struggle to make connections with other humans. Um, like for me, me for instance, um, I don't make connections with people. Um, I struggle a lot with social anxiety. Um, due to my autism and stuff. So I don't connect with people very well. Um, and apart from my brother and sisters, the only other human being I made a meaningful connection with was my partner John. Um, which was a big thing, you know, because there are some members of my family that I haven't even made a connection with, that I don't really even talk to much. 
and I'm really shy around and really anxious around due to the social anxiety. Um, but John, I met him through a mutual friend, someone we both knew, um, and we kind of clicked straight away. And, you know, we, we had a lot in common. We still do. We have a lot in common, you know, not only with the neurodiversities, neuro but, you know, um, same taste in music, same taste in movies. We both like video games. We both ha like wrestling. Um, you know, like WWE and WCW and TNA and stuff. We both like all that and we both watch all that. Um, so we had a lot in common and we kind of got to talking straight away. And it was like, I know it's going to sound cheesy, but it's like we'd known each other our whole lives. And I want to say it was true love at first sight. Um, and I know that sounds really cheesy. And yeah, but that's kind of, that's the easiest way I can describe it. Um, and we kind of clicked straight away. And that was really strange for me. And then we got to know each other more and we kind of decided to go out and start a relationship. And then we both decided to move in together. Uh, well, we got engaged first and then we moved in together after a rocky road of being homeless and but that's another story um and we got this place um like 11 years ago so there we go 11 years living in the same flat 12 years same relationship so I've kind of we've kind of proved the naysayers wrong there, where they said you won't be able to live on your own and look after yourself, won't be able to have a relationship. We me and John have both proved them wrong there. Um you know. Um so yeah, basically I'm just thinking like some advice for relationships. Um, well, as I've already said, having a lot in common, being friends first with your partner, being friends with your partner is important. Having things in common is important. So you have things to share with each other, um, things to talk about. Um, and I think also in relationships, arguing is good for relationships. I know that sounds crazy, but bear with me. Um, arguing once in a while in a relationship is good because you're getting things out. You're getting them off your chest. Um, you know, you need to share your feelings. Um, whether they be good or bad, you need to share those feelings in a relationship, you know. And if it's arguing, if you're arguing constantly, non-stop, all day, every day, every minute of the day, every second of the day, that's perhaps not a good relationship. And, you know, that needs maybe steering away from that kind of relationship. But if it's a relationship where once in a while you have a little argument about something or a little bicker of each other you know it can be small things like the toilet seat's been left up have a little moan about that you know um they've left the lid off the toothpaste moan about that 
they've left the crisp packet on the sofa when the bin is right next to them. You know, arguing and bickering about that sort of thing, that's fine in a relationship. And you need to let that out. Because if you don't, if you just bottle it up, that it's like a ball inside you. And each time you bottle something up, that ball gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that creates a lot of weight and a lot of stress on you. And a lot of stress and a lot of weight on your mental health. And mental health is already fragile when you have a, a neurotypical, a neurodiverse condition like autism. Your mental health is already fragile. So you don't want to add to that. So don't bottle it up. You know, if you're annoyed that they've left the toilet seat up again, tell them that, you know. They might have a little whinge back, oh, I'm sorry, oh, you know, it's not my fault. You could put it down yourself, you know. They might have a whinge back, but that's normal, that's okay. That's them letting off their steam. That's them getting out their stress. Okay, that's normal. And that is that is a healthy relationship, in my experience. Um, me and my partner bicker quite a bit. Well, we used to bicker more than we do now. I think where we've kind of grown up a little bit, we've got used to each other. So we don't bicker as much. We've learned to tolerate each other's little annoying habits. Um, so... That's one bit of advice I can give. Uh, another bit of advice. Um, time. Giving each other time and space. Now, giving time, making time for each other. Um, you know, making time to sit down together and chat. Just have a good chat about anything. Or sitting down together to watch a movie or something. Or go out on a date night together. You don't have to do it all the time. Once in a while. You know, do something nice for each other. Make time for each other. And also, time works as well. Give each other time and space. So, like, you need time away from each other sometimes. Um, and it's diff I know it's difficult, especially if... In your relationship, your other half is also your carer, like in mine. John's my fiancé and my carer. Um, so it's difficult to get time away. Um, especially, like, if you um, need round-the-clock care. Um, which I don't really need round-the-clock care, but... We spend a lot of time together because we have the same friends. <laughs> we, you know, we like the same stuff. So if he's going out somewhere to do something that I enjoy, he wants to take me with him because he knows I'm going to enjoy it. So he said, you're coming along too, you know. Because if I don't go with him to this event, he then comes home saying, oh my God, I wish you were with me. You would have loved it. You know, next time I'm taking you. <laughs> um, but, you know, but we still try and make give each other time and space. Um, like when we're out at a party or an event or something together, because John is a social butterfly. He likes to flap around and talk to everyone, um, you know, and he's always off chatting and whatever. And I don't like chatting to human beings so much. I'm, I'm working on that, but I struggle with it. So I tend to just, and where I can't walk around all the time because of my physical disabilities, I usually just stay sat down and I'm usually sat in a corner out the way somewhere. Um, 
and I enjoy the atmosphere and the entertainment and everything and I just sit and observe like a creepy little weirdo in the corner <laughs> um, but so I let him go and do and I said I let him that sounds a bit bossy and a bit I own you but no it's like I allow no that's wrong as well I allow him that that makes me sound like I'm his um master you choose <laughs> not to control my actions yeah I I choose to let I'm just gonna say it like that you know what I mean anyway I let him go off and be him I let him let his hair down and go speak to people and go and run around and jump about and dance around like a crazy person um i let him go and do all that and you know because he needs a break from me occasionally because i'm annoying <laughs> um but so giving each other time like on occasion there are times when i'll go off to my sister's or something on my own or go out shopping with my sister on my own and John will stay home and do whatever he does um you know so we get time away like that so giving each other time in a relationship and space is a good good thing um also I think um if you're getting into a relationship um, I think acceptance and openness and honesty are key as well especially if you're getting into a relationship um, and you have disabilities um, you need to be open and honest about them uh, because I, I'm always open and honest about my disabilities and my learning difficulties and my mental health um, because I feel that's the only way people are gonna understand it is if I teach them about it um, and when I met John I was fully open and honest with my about my conditions with him um, I made him fully aware what my condition was and how it affected me and the fact that it was degenerative um uh this is my marfan syndrome i've since been diagnosed with osteoarthritis and fibromyalgia as well physically um which was kind of out of the blue kind of thing um but I made it clear to John that about my disability and the fact that one day I could end up in a wheelchair uh, bound to a wheelchair and that and one day I would need more surgeries like heart surgeries and stuff like that and it is a possibility that you know I my lifespan would be quite short um so i was open and honest with him and you know because it's no good hiding your disability you know because it's not fair on the other person it's not fair on your partner if you're hiding your disability and one day something major happens medically with you and it's out of the blue and it's a shock to them and they're like whoa hang on a minute you know it's better to be fully open and honest then help them and prepare them and support them through it as well because when you have disabilities and you're going through things medically your family your partner goes through that with you you know so you need to make sure they're supported through it as well um 
so yeah be open and honest about your disabilities um i'm just trying to think what other advice i could give um always be yourself oh yeah always be yourself that's an obvious always be yourself uh so like with autism i have a lot of stims and a lot of annoying little behaviors and stuff um and i think sometimes they get on john's nerves he has some stims and annoying behaviors as well that get on mine <laughs> but we're accepting of them we're accepting of each other's stims and annoying behaviors um stims just in case people don't know what that is stims is um when you're overstimulated people with autism get overstimulated like with emotions like or stuff you know uh happiness too much excitement sadness can, stims can be good or bad you know you come from a good or bad place um but it's like when you're overwhelmed and you need to get that feeling out sometimes we do it through movement or making silly noises um stuff like that like me i rub my face when i'm when i'm nervous um and anxious i rub my face a lot and stuff um sometimes i don't even realize i'm doing it um when i'm excited and overly happy about something i do this <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um you know um and i do that thing of jiggling my legs all the time as well when i'm bored or when i'm overly excited you know um so i have a lot of weird little stems like that and you know weird behaviors that are brought on by my disabilities and john's very accepting of that and i'm very accepting of his so being accepting that's a good one i think um but yeah i think that's all i can think of at the moment um but yeah, if you have any good advice for relationships, um, do comment below this video, either on YouTube or on my Facebook, uh, Chronically Suki. Um, yeah, just comment, leave a comment with the advice. Um, but I hope this video has been informative and a little bit helpful and that. And... I'm going to have to go now because I need to go sleep. I'm tired. Thanks for watching. See you all later. Bye bye.